there. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, the talks have all been really interesting um, and I'm looking forward to talking to some of the participants. Um, so yes, my research is on recreating sound and place in Scottish Highland landscapes. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a bit about my case study at Glencoe. Um, so some of the sort of research questions that I'm interested in looking at through my research. Um, yeah, creating landscape scale immersive sound experiences, what, what does it mean to sort of create these on a landscape scale? Um, when we've got places such as Glencoe, you really want to incorporate as much of that experience into your immersive interactive experience as possible. Um, and, you know, how can elements such as like site specific performance or, you know, how can we kind of archaeology and heritage borrow from these dis different disciplines that have already kind of explored themes like this um, into immersive experiences. Um, ways in which audio reconstructions and engagements uh, can engage with audiences in meaningful ways. Um, so I guess kind of stripping back the form of the more visually dominant um, approaches that from the, you know, from cultural heritage, um, how can how can audio reconstructions kind of, what can they offer um, audiences when they're already kind of confronted with a very sort of rich um, and meaningful uh, visual representation in front of them in the, in the very physical form? kind of just covered that how does this differ to visual I think something that I've been really interested in um, coming from an archaeological background is the sort of lack of visual presence of the of the archaeology underfoot um, and the sort of how to sort of um, oralize this um, and, and how this kind of plays this sort of auditory presence versus just kind of what we consider a desolate sort of landscape, although I will kind of go into that a bit more. I think it's more complex than that. Um, and yes, this kind of promotion of more nuanced interactions and interpretations of place, I guess, kind of rather than a lot of people at the minute, maybe just experience um, the landscape of Glencoe, kind of driving through it, walking through it. but. What what um what can it mean to be out in the landscape interpreting the lumps and bumps in the landscape and and as archaeology, um so my kind of approach from an immersive audio perspective has been kind of informed by sonic artists such as Hildegard Westerkamp and Jeanette Cardiff um just to name a few I guess they've kind of really I guess it was these sound artists that when sound ecologists that were really kind of exploring the medium of of immersion in audio um it's kind of been said that um um that headphones are kind of an early form of of immersive hardware in a way so it kind of i really like this idea of kind of going back to the sort of bare bones of of what we can do with um augmented reality um, XR and stuff like that. Um, they were, they're also integral component to games. Um, they kind of lend themselves to emotional elements, but also kind of the actions that the player is undertaking or sort of where they are in the game, if they're in a sort of enclosed space or a, or a cavernous space. Um, and as I was saying just there, acoustics can be reproduced um, to give um, sense of space and place um, and these sort of unique acoustical qualities that that, that places have. Um, so sound and heritage, um, this is just a very whistle stop tour because um, it's obviously a lot more complex than this, but I guess I kind of started with the traditional audio tour um, and this very nice um, advert here. It kind of um, came to the forefront of cultural heritage organizations well they started using them in the 50s um but they kind of provided a very sort of didactic interpretation of place or subject matter um and i guess um 
traditional kind of exhibition techniques using sound installation in exhibitions or heritage experiences kind of my mind goes to the Jorvik experience or um, I think the Calvin Grove had um, some sort of background noises in some of their early people's galleries um, and really this is kind of about sort of supplementing the experience providing atmosphere providing context but um, more and more it's been increasingly a focal point um, and a sort of main event to heritage interpretation um, and these heritage spaces um, and I guess these different forms have lent from have built on I guess the works of uh, Jeanette Cardiff um, and um, Hildegard Westerkamp uh, with sort of creative sound arts um, within a heritage context um, Geolocative, um, site specific, and then reconstructing past acoustic spaces. Um, Stuart earlier was talking a bit about some of the work at Fingal's Cave, um, but there's work done at the University of York and University of Edinburgh as well. Um, I've got links to the end if people want to look at those, but um, immersive audio in my research, here's me standing at Signal Rock in Glencoe, actually looking the wrong way, I not looking down the right glen, but you get the gist. Um, so I'm kind of thinking of a blend of AR and XR um, and the sort of sound installation. I haven't really formalised what exactly the technical kind of labelling of my experience will be because I, I don't really personally want to be limited by that but I guess at, um, at the core I am augmenting a user's experience of landscape with sound um, and but arguably the sort of the place itself is as important as these layers that are being added through sound and you know the possibilities for chance encounters with local like like um, people kind of wandering through the landscape, but also kind of the sounds of the motorway and other sort of things going on are as equally important to the story. Um, and yeah, so creation of spatialized content. Lisa, um, just to hit on this, um, I guess this is really important in terms of um, kind of localizing yourself and creating a sort of digital audio space that that my users will navigate around um, just because um, visually there isn't a lot there I'm probably basing my work um, at this site at Achtriachten um, which kind of has potentially some um, some remains of sites that were kind of contemporaneous with the massacre so um, I guess trying to sort of build up acoustically and sort of auditory what what the um the space would have been like um and yes yeah, so as i said here you using acoustics to maybe reconstruct turf houses or other structures and sort of um kind of get people immersed in these in these acoustic spaces whilst they're not visually present um, so yeah, the why Glencoe, I guess, um, I was attracted to it because of these very sort of traditional romantic narratives that kind of surround the, um, the Glen itself, the stories of massacre, um, the sort of McDonald's of uh, Glencoe being um, um, killed by the, the Campbells, this sort of traditional story that is become very nationally important story and internationally, I guess, as the sort of um, the audiences are wide reaching. But um, in reality, um, you kind of, you drive along the roads and um, you've got the very noisy A82 um, when you're standing there. And I think that some people would be disappointed by this because I think they'd think that that's not the authentic experience. But then I really want to kind of explore this authenticity in my work and sort of, kind of arguably what was probably quite noisy landscapes at the time. Um, so very quickly going through my methodology, I'm kind of recollecting and recreating sounds of the landscape from the 17th, 18th century kind of 
through looking through the audio archives provided by Ambali and Topar and Dolkis and engaging with these uh, Gaelic stories, um, it kind of got this wonderful collection that needs to be used really. Um, and then looking at traditional farming processes that were pre-improvement, um, threshing, using cornstone, walking the cloth, the incorporations of songs into these as well. Um, these these are all very noisy processes and kind of almost in kind of industrial sounding processes in a way. Um, and I guess I'm kind of thinking about how that lends into um, into soundscape creation composition. And then there's the process of me collecting sounds in the landscape, um, my old field practice, kind of going from iPhone to kind of going up market. Um, what I'm recording in the landscape, it's all part of the creative process um, at, the, at the moment of capture. Yeah, and the sort of technological practices involves. Um, and then the sort of creation and experimentation with soundscapes and acoustics um, kind of going forward into sort of pulling these uh, sounds together um, composing, but also thinking about how I communicate abstract concepts through sounds, sorts of geology, archaeological site formation processes and ecological change. Um, Liz, if you and could yeah. wrap up maybe. Oh yeah, because sorry. we're running a little bit out of time. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yes. So just to wrap up, that um, will kind of be the formation processes of my methodology, um, but it's all very much a process still. And um, yeah, I'm happy to hear or answer questions at the after the talks on that. And thank you for listening.